Welcome to the Property Experts Podcast, where you'll find open conversations, no bullshit attitudes, and deep dive insights from award-winning property developers and business owners, Ben Richards and Jack Jiggins. Together, they've delivered over 40 million in gross development value over the last five years and have a pipeline of over 25 million to deliver in the next 18 months. They've built numerous other seven-figure businesses with six-figure net profits around their property ecosystem, and it's by no means been an easy ride. So on this podcast, they'll share their weekly trials and tribulations running multiple businesses, giving you never before seen insights into the inner workings of finding, funding, designing, delivering and selling award winning property deals, together with golden nuggets of advice through the five key areas of any business, marketing, sales, operations, finance and talent. If you're a young entrepreneur looking to get started or have a small team, but you're looking to scale your business to the next level, this is the no bullshit podcast for you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the XP Property Expose Q&A. Welcome to all the new viewers and additional welcome to those that come and visit and say hello every week. Thanks for it, uh, very much for that. It makes it all worth it. So welcome. Jack's actually over in Turkey at the moment on holiday. It's his turn to go and enjoy himself although he's just told me that most of the day he's been working which you know standard for entrepreneurs and business owners to be working on holiday but today we are going to be discussing these things we're going to be looking at uh, one of the planning approvals that we've got at our project in princess risborough um, you'll find out what yada 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 means we're going to be talking about legal packs and a couple of tips for property developers around those and selling properties some business tips in terms of trademarks and i'm actually going through a trademark dispute at the moment so we can talk a little bit more about that um, i spent about three hours this morning filming a property um, that aura finished last summer which looks absolutely fantastic so we'll talk about that a little bit and then we've got two refinances on some of our projects going through at the moment um, jack can fill you in on some of those and we're going to be discussing again the open day that we are doing next saturday so stay tuned for more details around that anything you wanted to say jack no let's kick off crack on cool so we've been waiting for a long long time we're talking probably six months for planning approvals on sunset court the main one being the introduction of some roof lights and some balconies for the building to the rear which is the the office conversion to four four flats unfortunately i don't have good news from that perspective yet because we haven't seen an official approval the recommendation from planning officer has gone to the senior officer recommending approval but i'm not going to count my chickens until they come in what we did have though is a successful planning approval for the section 73 application that we made for the external works and the landscaping now we've had an absolute nightmare with with this process the site's quite complicated in terms of the planning applications that were approved originally there was a planning approval separately for the two houses, and then the um, original uh, office conversion was a, a prior approval application under Class MA. Now, we had to discharge some planning conditions for the landscaping, including surfacing materials and, and all of that sort of stuff, which is absolutely fine. Um, but we didn't really like the approved site plan from the full planning application of the two new houses. So we just wanted to make some amendments, um, make the green areas more green, add some um, boundary treatment and just play around with it to make it a bit more usable for us. They, The planning officers didn't like the fact that we changed the layout. They wanted us to just discharge the planning condition based on the original site plan. Now, we didn't like the original site plan, so we wanted to change it. We went through two applications where we were just trying to discharge the planning conditions with the new arrangement, but they rejected both of those and forced us down the route of the Section 73 route, um, which it basically um, varies the planning conditions that you get um, in your decision notice. So we've now got a variation of condition two and six or whatever it was um, in regards to the landscaping and the hard surfacing and boundary treatments and all that sort of stuff to approve the lovely, beautiful gardens that you see in the courtyard in front of the development here so yeah success not the main success that we want with the with the main application that allows us to actually finally finish this scheme it's 95 percent complete we've got to get those roof lights in we've got to get this recessed balcony um, to this gable end and those are the final pieces of the puzzle but you know success nonetheless um, so just a quick note on the site open day next saturday and we'll be talking a little bit more about that later in this 
discussion. Two comments. Who have we got? Cool. I need to look at a LinkedIn message from Barkin. Thanks very much. Um, I will look at that afterwards. Doesn't really add much value to it now, so we'll um, move on. Yada stands for the Young Architects and Developers Alliance, and it is the start of the London Festival of Architecture this week. And I was invited to the Heels uh, building on Tottenham Court Road, that beautiful building that you see on the screen. I didn't know what to expect. I've never been invited before. A previous work colleague of one of my team actually invited me over LinkedIn. Um, and I opened the you know the doors from the lift opened up and there were about 400 people in the room. I could barely hear anything because the chatter was so loud. It was absolutely bustling. 90% of the room were probably architects. The rest of the 10% were were developers. An absolute stomping ground for XP surveys to go in and throw some cards out, Jack. I made some good contacts and actually said that, you know, we'd be interested in sponsoring the event in the future um, because right. it's, uh, it is our, you know, it is our client base. Exactly. Um, but they put on a good spread, lots of food. And it was a great opportunity to meet other architects and developers in the space and build, um, build upon um, our network, basically. Um, if you are an architect or if you are a developer, typically this is for, um, I'm surprised I got an invite because it's meant to be for sort of under 35s, but I've managed to squeeze in. But if you are interested, get in touch, follow them on, on LinkedIn, um, reach out. It's a great place for young, young architects coming up through to get some insight into the market, what people are up to. Um, expand your network potentially look at you know hr and recruitment opportunities you know for me wednesday night was a fantastic opportunity to meet part two architects part three architects just graduating um you know we're looking to recruit in our architecture so it was a great evening of networking um chatting and uh you know generally meeting new people so yeah i would highly recommend visiting that event if you are a young architect or an aspiring developer and actually the the amount of almost every architect that i spoke to when i said i do both architecture and develop um were very envious they they all pretty much want to move into the development space and i, I had to say that it's um it's not without its risks it's not without its difficulties but it is you know, a very fruitful place to be if you can make it work so yeah get in touch if you're interested in that anything you wanted to say about legal packs jack before i yeah, I'm, I'm, I was just going to touch on actually from an acquisitions perspective. Happy to do that because it's obviously methodical to um, to selling. So legal packs tends to be the most common terminology when someone pulls something together, putting a property into sale and auction. But you can do, and Ben's going to come on to this. You can pull together your legal pack before your buyer is ready or before you've even marketed the property, and it gets all of your ducks in a row to prepare a quicker, more speedier sale. Um, to get the relevant documents all in one place. This is really, really common in auctions because when the hammer goes down, the buyer exchange. So on that day, the legal pack has to be pretty much complete or be as fulfilled as it can be. Some auction properties don't have very large legal packs. But from a acquisitions perspective, the and specifically more for auctions, we have a process. We do occasionally buy an auction. Most of the time when we bought an auction, We've bought pre-auction or post-auction. Pre, where we can agree a price and get it bought before it goes into the room. If we think it may be undervalued or after if we think the site or the property has been overvalued. So now where do legal packs come in more importantly? We have a conveyancing solicitor we use on all of our acquisitions and they're not necessarily the cheapest. Um, and it is quite a short, sharp and fast process to get a legal pack turned around from a from a from a legal perspective, so getting advice on a report and title, um, report and pack. Um, so we actually have a contact who's probably been watching us, or maybe even this video, which is Bushra, um, who's a who's a qualified uh, solicitor, and she does our own one-off quick turnaround uh, and at a very reasonable value, uh, a legal pack review. So it is very different from a buying perspective because obviously we're reviewing the pack. And reviewing what's being given to us, but there's a lot that you would need to look through in terms, you know, details in auction packs can be really, really minute and specific. For example, some sellers push the buying fee onto the buyer. That detail can be featured in the legal pack. You might overlook that and then end up getting whacked with a auction fee without knowing it. So there's tons to look through when it comes to legal packs, but that's more of an acquisition perspective. If anyone wants an introduction to push on, let me know. We also have a sort of fact find thing that we have ourselves so obviously if the title's okay what the restrictive covenants is there any planning issues planning history structural perspective what's the building condition like because obviously you're sort of fumbling around in the dark with auctions but that's um a bit of a review on an acquisitions perspective 
cool good stuff um i wanted to touch on legal packs from a sale perspective because we're going through this process on sunset court now and you know we haven't been as efficient as we could be with this so this will hopefully help people that are getting to the end of their their schemes to pull together a robust pack of information whereby if you do get your sales start coming through and offer start coming through the door and you're going through the legal process you've got your ducks in a row to um, speed up that process and give the solicitor everything that they need. So I thought I'd pull together a, a quick list of some of the things that we're, we're currently pulling together for um, Sunset Court. You'll see the, the title plans, which are what, what I've shown on this image. So if you've got flats and you've got you know, leasehold flats, you've got the, the, the red line indication of where that demise of that flat is. And then we've also got um, in this particular project, we've got a site plan with a few other details. So you know, your red line is for your demise of the actual property. Um, we've shown our garden spaces or private amenity in blue out the front and back. We've got this hatched pink area, which is effectively the areas that the buyer of this flat has access to, you know, on road and foot, obviously across the car park and then by foot across the uh, um, the courtyard spaces and the passageways. And then the orange indicates the location of the parking bay. So an architect might be able to create this for you or a surveyor. You will just have to run by the solicitor exactly kind of what they expect to see and how they expect it to be presented there's very rigid things that um, land registry needs so north arrows um, you know scale bars or all this sort of stuff but um, your solicitor can help advise on all of those things so title plans is one of them um, planning documents as i mentioned earlier this project has been fraught with planning issues so there are a lot of separate planning applications there are a lot of decision notices there are a lot of planning conditions that have been discharged so there's a you know a, a discharge notice for those so ultimately getting all of that stuff in one place to send over to the um, solicitor is just going to help things along nice and spo uh, smoothly so all of your um, planning decisions all of your condition discharge decisions um, and anything else relevant that the solicitor is going to need to pass on to the buyer any building warranties that you've got in place, so structural defect warranties or or PCCs, um, which are professional consultant certificates, um, any type of building warranties that you've got on the site, building control certificates, you know, the final certificates from them and any associated information, all of your fire, electrical, gas certificates, your sign off commissioning certificates and things like that. An O&M manual, preferably. So we package up all of our O&Ms into a Google Drive link send that across to the um, the solicitor. And actually, we, we might still be updating that that drive link as and when the contractors drip feed some of those those operations and maintenance manuals throughout the process or at the end of the project once it's all been installed. Home user guides are a legal requirement. We've got a template for these. If you're interested, drop a comment below, home user guide, and we'll get in touch and we can send you kind of a template of what we use for our home user guides. Um, one thing we've done recently on sale of all of our assets when the new buyers move into their their new homes, we send a hamper and some drinks. Um, you know, it might cost us hundred quid, but you know, genuinely, the email that we got from our most recent you know, buyer, which she was so so thankful, I'm um, so appreciative. It's just a nice little you know customer cuddle from a developer to welcome people to their new home. I remember when I bought my bought my first flat about twelve years ago. I had a, a hamper from Halifax with you know some some wine and some um, other bits and bobs, and actually a, a little handy toolkit you know, with a little screwdriver set and all this sort of stuff, which I thought was cool. So yeah, just things like that help you as a developer kind of build your brand. And it went down really well with, uh, it's gone down really well with our, our previous buyers. Make sure you've got your EPCs in line, um, you know, again, a legal requirement. And then any information about your service charges. So have a think about how the site is structured. This one's relatively complicated with the flats and the houses and then shared communal car park. Um, so there's service charges to, to maintain all of that. And we had to set up a management company that then takes that the new buyers kind of take ownership of to manage that process, manage the site and decide, you know, how often they get the gardeners around, how often the waste is disposed of, um, any maintenance that might need doing. So hopefully that's useful for, for people and you can use it as a bit of a checklist for your projects as you go along. Jack, do you want to start talking about this one? So this yeah, is sort cool. of business tips. Yeah, so it was actually uncanny that um, so Ben and I are in a group with FDM, our marketing guy, who helps us pull these together. And in our... In our group, Ben said that he wanted to talk about trademarks because obviously, uh, I won't give a spoiler a spoiler alert, Ben's going through some trademark stuff this week. And critically, in our in the Developers Club group, we were also talking about trademarking. And in my opinion, when you're setting up a new business, specifically probably more focused on service-based businesses or businesses that are offering something or your development company, 
there's three main sort of short, sharp checklists that I would highly recommend doing before getting too ingrained in branding, naming, logoing, meaningfulness, et cetera. And these, these are not the only three, but these are three really good starting points for you to get a really good understanding if you're going to come up. Um, what we're mainly talking about here is competition in the same area, similar branding, copy branding, copyright branding, things like that. So the three main checks that I'd recommend is look on Company's House, easy as anything. Go on to search Company's House, search the names that you're looking for, see if there's anything similar or see if there's anything worded with similar names. Domain, so you need to be buying your company domain, which is the bit that goes in your email and your website. Um, and that is normally bought through most commonly 123reg or GoDaddy. See if it's available because if you pick a name, pick the branding, set it up on Company's House, and then you go to buy the domain, and you end up getting .org, .uk, .something else, it doesn't look that professional. Um, so always pick a branding there, where there's .com or .co.uk. Um, some companies do go international, so .uk, but in my opinion, I think .co.uk and .com are the most trusted and robust uh, domain names that you can buy. Little top tip, you could buy more than one just to protect yourself in the future when it comes to domains for the sake of £10 a year. And then last but uh, not least is trademarking. So trademarking is fundamentally as what you may think. It's trademarking and copywriting your name, your logo, or your business in the sector that you want to be operating in. And it's much more formal and almost legal practice over than just selecting a name because it's available. Um, when we, when Ben and I did our companies, we got a um, an actual barrister involved to help us make sure that we got the right application going forward and we were well represented. So if anyone, anyone out there thinking of setting up a business or you're, you have set up a business, just go and check these three areas. Obviously, if you've set the business up on Company's House, you've already secured that naming. And it's quite easy for you to change your name. What you've got to remember is before you go public, before you go out there and before you start um, spending small fortunes on creating your brand, creating your alternative presence across different platforms, you want to make sure that these three main areas are covered off. And Ben, I think Ben's going to give you a bit of an example of why this might be beneficial, specifically speaking on trademark. If you're excited by some of the property developments or investments that we talk about on this show and want to know more about investing £100,000 or more with XP, email info at xpproperty.co.uk to set up a call with one of our team. We can discuss our open investment opportunities and provide you with our track record details showing with complete transparency our historic performance project by project and how you could be part of our growing pipeline of developments. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, I was looking at my my domain list um, a couple of weeks ago. I think it's about 30 domains that I bought and own now, uh, mainly because I kind of, something pops into my head in terms of maybe that's a good idea for the future. You know, I, I want to kind of almost secure that, that that web domain. And we've done the same thing with XP property, XP surveys. You know, I've got or a hyphen architecture or architecture um, or homes or hyphen homes. Or, you know, there's all sorts of things that I, I've bought as a domain just to kind of like, you know, protect myself in the future. And I think people set up businesses very early on without necessarily thinking how big do they want to grow and how big could it get? I'm thinking 10 years ahead. They're just thinking, you know, how what do I, I just want to set up my business, want to get going without actually thinking about 10 years in the future, how big the company may get and protecting yourselves for that, that, that period of time. They're just thinking about here and now instead of actually thinking longer term about how big you want your business to go and how to protect yourself from day one by doing, doing all of those things that, that Jack's been talking about. So yeah, I am, um, I'm currently going through a few issues and have been for the last, I mean, potentially even year, actually, we, we might have started having conversations this time last year, but I've, I've trademarked Aura Architecture, Aura Architecture and Interiors, um, the actual word Aura, um, when it, when it relates to you know construction, architecture, design, that side of stuff. So yeah, we were notified that somebody registered a new trademark under Aura Kitchens about a year ago. Um, it's a company called Meraway Kitchens, relatively big brand, but work directly pre well predominantly with sort of B two B people and um, like direct to sort of direct to consumer, maybe no sort of direct to. So so Aura Kitchens is a brand of kitchen cabinetry that they've created to sell direct to sort of businesses so to direct to resellers they don't sell our kitchens to the open market but they sell it to specific resellers and i was notified of of, of you know 
the Mary Kitchen is kind of registering this this trademark, which it does. So if you are registered on the Intellectual Property Office platform, which is on the screen here, if there is something similar um, submitted as an application, it will notify the similar trademarks to say, look, something else has been registered. We think there's overlap with kind of what your trademark um, is registered for. Have a look at it. Let us know what you think, that type of thing. So I looked at it. It, it had a lot of overlapping things with us as a design practice. So, you know, we design kitchens as part of our interior design. And there's a lot of design function that we do that they were trying to trademark as Aura Kitchens. Now, you know, in 10 years time, I might, I might want to start and branch out into kitchen design and kitchens. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying I will do that but I want to protect myself if I do want to do that. So I don't really want somebody coming in now and offering and, and trademarking Aura Kitchens from a design perspective um, because I might in the future want to do that. And because I've already registered Aura Architecture or Interiors or that sort of stuff, you know, I was notified and I can put a, put a, put a stop to this or a strict um, what they can register. So I've had a call, um, a couple of calls with, with Meriway, the guys at Meriway, um, you know, good outfit, um, really nice guys. And we've been back and forth for the last year in uh, discussing, you know, what, what what really is it they're looking for? Um, and we've, we've kind of got to the crux of the fact that Aura Kitchens for them um, is the joinery. It's, you know, not selling to the wider market, you know, direct to consumer. It's selling to businesses and, and sort of resellers. And we've managed to come up with a, you know, a heads of terms agreement whereby the registration of their trademark is restricted to things that won't restrict some of the things I want to do longer term, um, but also gives them the ability to kind of do what they want from a kitchen cabinetry perspective. So yeah, we've been back and forth numerous times. We've had a couple of video calls. Um, we've been back and forth on um, agreeing the heads of terms, but we're now in a place where the heads of terms are agreed. Um, we've pushed it over to our, our trademark lawyer um, to draw up a, a formal agreement uh, and we're moving forward for, from that perspective. So it's been a really interesting process to go through. You know, I, I could have not been, I, I feel like I was maybe a bit stubborn about it. Maybe I don't want to ever go into Aura Kitchens, but I just felt like if I did want to in 20 years time, and I, I would have kicked myself if I didn't at least dig my heels in now to protect myself for that future. Might cost me three or four grand now, um, but that could be money well spent. The other thing that I've got into the Heads of Terms Agreement is that if Aura Kitchens, from their perspective, ever goes into liquidation or they they can they discontinue their Aura Kitchens line, that the Aura tra Aura Kitchens trademark automatically transfers over to me. So you know that's part of the negotiation that we've kind of been discussing. So yeah, I think you know I feel like I've protected myself for future endeavours. May not ever happen, but yeah, I felt like it was the right thing to do. Cool. Number six. So today, this morning, I've been on site with Dan, my marketing manager. We've been filming this project for, for two, two and a half hours. It, it, <laughs> there's a lot more baby stuff in this house um, from these these photos that were done uh, late last year when it was finished. Um, you know, they've recently had a baby. And, you know, when you have a baby, you realize how messy it is. Um, but there's toys and stuff everywhere. But it was, you know, it was a great opportunity to revisit one of our sites I love it. I think it looks absolutely fantastic. I hadn't actually seen it finished at all until today. I've just seen these photos. So it was great to go and actually see the quality of the workmanship, you know, take a look at some of the finer details, you know, exactly how these, you know, tiles line up with the width of the, the Oriel window, um, the level of detail that, you know, our architects have gone to to kind of um, detail this really well. Sit in this Oriel window, which lets in loads of light and this house tour will be coming out in the next two or three weeks. So if you're not already subscribed to the Aura Architecture YouTube channel, head over there now and subscribe. Um, you know, this is one of, I think, five house tours that we've done. Um, and every one that we do gets better and better. You know, we, we've upped the level of equipment and, you know, sound voice recording stuff that we've done. And every one that we do, we hope to make just that little bit better. So if you've got any feedback on it, constructive or positive, we'd like to know because it helps us improve what we do and tell us about what you would like to to know about these types of things you know it, I, I feel like people want to know what the cost is um, we try to give a, a breakdown of kind of how much things cost a little bit about the kind of detail of the process the planning process the build process any issues that were had but yeah fundamentally that's what i think i'd love to know what what you guys think about how we can make those things better because we're going to be doing a lot of xp property tours um, as well in the future so any feedback is good feedback cool 
refinancing. On to, on to refinancing. So you'll see there in the photo in front, this is our double award winning um, 14 flat development in Abingdon, Oxfordshire. Um, the, the photo on the left is just as we had bought the site and the photo on the right is once we had uh, done a lot of work in the loft and added four dormers and, and we're also, what you can't see is just finishing off the 14th flat refurbishment. But we're topical, we're, we're refinancing two sites, one exit bridge and this is long-term finance. We've been moving around the market to see what the best option is for us. And when we are talking about options, we're talking about trackers, fixing, loan to values, interest rates. What else are we looking at? Serviceability, interest only, or some part repayment. Um, and we've actually settled on this particular scheme on a fixed five-year mortgage of 5.3% uh, for a block product. So that's the whole site on, on one mortgage, which is what we're opting for. The other particular site is more exit finance. So it's short-term exit finance while we're selling off the flats, this site that we just showed you we're keeping, the other one we're selling, therefore it's more cost effective to get onto something a lot more short term. I also, probably relative on the topic of refinancing, one thing, one major change that I have actually seen in terms of rates is, I don't want to bore everyone listening with the interest rates and where they're going and what they're looking like, but what we are seeing is a two, three year, five year fixed product. The arrangement fee is really hefty, talking like 3% arrangement fee on term finance. So if you fix something for five years, uh, these, these arrangements used to be 1.5, 0.75, 1.25. They're now 3% for the same duration of that product. So not only have the interest rate cost gone up, I'd say be careful of arrangement fees because they have equally gone up. And it might be worth you looking at different products because if your interest uh, arrangement fee is 3%, your early redemption is like 3%. If you plan to get off or re, 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 uh, refinance anything, that might actually be a really expensive way to go. So be careful of the periphery fees around these mortgages. Um, ours is 2% arrangement for a five-year fix at 5.3%, which we're happy with, which is 65% loan to value um, on our 14 uh, rented out flats. One of, one of them is an HMO, but the, the, the block brings in about £183,000. Rental roll interest, and most of that will go to the mortgage, um, which is sad, but it's life. Yeah, it's what it is. I was speaking to uh, or Sam um, from uh, Merry Oaks, gave a good presentation about this at Brendan's event last week. He was actually saying some lenders uh, are charging up to seven or eight percent arrangement fees, mm. which he said, to be honest, he's never done an eight percent. He's done a five percent arrangement fee, which is still, you know, ludicrous. But you know, they're they're lenders are, are pushing things yeah. at the moment they're I, testing, I would, testing things yeah i would caveat that with it all depends what you're getting for that there's a value where a yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's a value where everything works for an example we were buying a, f a flat in central suites and we were paying on a mortgage a percent a month which sounds really expensive considering we could have waited five months and got a four pro probably at that moment time three percent mortgage but we were getting a huge discount to move quickly, which was way in excess of the cost of finance. So sometimes it's worth assessing the situation and why you need it. But yeah, an eight, nine percent arrangement fee is, uh, we might have to go into something else then. I know, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Cool. I mean, it's worth keeping on the point of refinancing. Jack mentioned the exit bridge. Um, Sunset Court, you know, is is the property and the development that we are moving on to an exit bridge. We're basically coming off the back of our development finance We've got one of the six houses into legals, which is great. But obviously, there's going to be a, a period of time now, hopefully sort of three or four months where we get offers through the door and we start selling selling all of these units. But the development finance loan period is, is coming to an end. We need to find a solution and exit bridging is designed specifically for that. So you, you take out the exit bridge for, let's say, 12 months. The rate that I think we're paying is like 0.82% a month or something like that. and the idea is that obviously as and when you you sell a unit, you pay off that that debt as it goes down. There are there are some exit bridging lenders that will actually allow you as the developer to take some of the sales proceeds. So, you know, they might allow you to take 20% of the sales proceeds on every sale to allow future funding of other deals as opposed to just continuing to pay down all of the debt. 
um, which is interesting. You know, it's a way of getting some of your money back quicker to you know either pay down some of your own debt or sort of move on and acquire other opportunities. So worth looking out for. But um, yeah, that's the site that we're actually doing the the exit bridge for. So onto the open day. Yeah, next Saturday, tenth of June, ten till two. We'll have a couple of you know drinks and nibbles. Um, we've invited our investor base, our solicitors, our consultants, family, friends. Um, my little boy Lucas will be there running around causing havoc, I'm sure. And we'd love to see more of you there. So if you're interested in coming along, um, we're going to be talking through some of the difficulties that we've had with the site. We'll have a TV on site where we can talk through the, the sort of show the construction process of how it's um, how things have progressed. We did do a time lapse video of the new builds. I haven't seen whether the batteries were char- changed enough to actually make I, it worthwhile yet. Yeah, I've seen. I've I've seen that. Is it all so. good? Yeah, it's fine. I mean, it might take us a week to put it together, but um, yeah, cool. Yeah, it is this there. Good. So, I mean, well, yeah, we'll we'll be showing kind of the whole progress of um, this site as it's unfolded, and you'll get to see the finished article. Ask us questions that you may have about how we've worked this scheme. We'll talk about the finances and the issues and difficulties that we've had with it. So, I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about everything, won't we? How we found it, how we then secured that in legals because it was a very competitive bidding process. How we've added value, what finance we used, how we structured that. So, everything that you would, would want to know from a 360 end to end development of a four flat and two house development site. We'll, we'll be we'll be sharing on the day. Yeah, perfect. Well, that's it from us. Um, If you're interested in coming to the site tour, do let us know. But thanks for tuning in if you have done and see you next week. See you everyone. These live Q&A episodes are all about helping you grow your business and build a property portfolio that provides financial wealth. If you have specific topics that you'd like us to discuss, make sure to comment on the platform you're listening on or email info at xpproperty.co.uk so that we can discuss your topic in future episodes. And if you found these conversations valuable for growing your business, make sure to click that follow button and we'd really love for you to tell just one person about us. Thank you.